Hey, guess what? It's Thursday again, and this is Real Monsters. And <laughs> I'm so tired, I don't want to do the show. I mean, I do, but you know. <laughs> there, how's that? Good. We're going, Wes. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem. And also joining us is Kelly Evans. Oh, good evening, good morning. Whatever Hope you guys went to the bathroom because I'm not stopping the car. <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> we just started. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a thing this the other day, um, uh, and I thought I would share a picture. A, a, I, I don't often take a selfie, but for the first time in about over three years, I shaved. I shaved my beard off. And so I thought I would share a picture of what I look like now without my beard. And that'll be coming up any moment now. Thank you, lag time. <laughs> oh, my word. This is so slow. There we go. Yeah, there you go. And that's what I look like without the beard. Slog, debonair, <laughs> snarky. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll follow that up with M of the Week. Before we get into the guts of achy, fakey art, fakey, breaky art. Puns, puns are fun. Uh, it's you know there didn't used to be the same amount of lag time and it really kind of bugs me Aww. yeah one of M's favorite things to do is to look sad the other is to sleep <laughs> those, are more, yeah, those, those are some pretty mournful eyes it, and it works for her it's very effective I can imagine. She probably got you trained well. Yep. Quite well. <laughs> All right. So where are we going to start? We're gonna, Today we're talking about art forgeries. Yeah. Kelly, what are we doing? I think I want to start with a story because all good shows start with a story. So we'll start with Once Upon a Time. There was an artist who wasn't getting aware of life, he wasn't getting any jobs. Um, he was struggling to make his way, same as all artists are. Mm -hmm. um, he found that um, he could actually put his skill to use in making fake Greek and Roman antiquities. So mm -hmm. these were pretty, these were pretty um, this was in like, I don't know, we'll say the, the Middle Ages. And oh, these okay. type of items were um, very, very popular amongst the wealthy citizens of Rome. Um, but you can imagine you can't really find a lot of them kicking around anymore unless you happen to dig one up someplace. So there were very few genuine artifacts that survived uh, more than a millennium. So, it, they, they, the, so, so this guy decided that um, while he was under the employ of the powerful Medici family, he was um, asked by a rival sculptor to help him make a statue that looked like it had been buried and rediscovered. He said yes, 
So they made the statue. They rubbed the statue in acidic soil to age it. And it, it actually looked old. It actually looked like a, like a, an old Roman statue. Um, it was so good so much that the uh, cardinal, Cardinal Raffaello Riaro, oh, I can't, uh, this name, Raffaello Riaro of <laughs> San Giorgio, um, he actually bought it and um, displayed it. But then... <laughs> But then he decided. He, he figured that uh, he realized he'd been tricked. Um, he decided not oh. to press charges. He, he was a nice guy because the forgery was just so good, and the art, you know, the artistic quality to the forgery was so good that um, he said he did, the artist deserved to get away, away with it. Um, now the artist. That was, <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting attitude. <laughs> yeah. The artist that we're talking about is actually Michelangelo. So this was years before he... Oh! Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he was an art teacher. Well, there you go. That kind of gets into a central plank of all this, too, is how we value stuff. Well, it's it's been going on for ages. (laughs) Yeah, it's not new, is it? Well... I mean, how we uh, actually value the um, painting, sculpture, what have you. Think about had the cardinal never found out that it was fake, he would have still been happy. Yeah. Uh, a lot like the placebo effect, it seems. Well, there's actually, um, we'll go through, like, we're going to go through, when I want to sort of go through what, okay, so that was the story. And then we're going to do sort of what is a forgery? What does it mean? How do they, how do they, how do, how are forgers doing the stuff that they're doing? Um, and then we're going to go through some, uh, some of my favorites. There's one in particular that I, I can't wait to get to. Um, and then we'll also discuss, like, how do you detect a fake and what sort of technology is used? And yeah, that's pretty much what I'd like to do. Okay. Cool. Guys. Yeah, no problem there. My cat's decided to join me, so you may hear some noise. Um, I don't have the heart. <laughs> I have the heart to throw them out of my of my office. Um, so, what is an art fake? It, it sounds like a fairly straightforward question. Um, and we were talking about this earlier. Um, it's actually um, it's presented as it's presented um, by one artist as being done by another artist. So whether you're faking something that was done a thousand years ago or faking something that was done yesterday, it's all still art forgery. There's no time limit to any of the uh, any of the forgeries. Um, and it's not necessarily a crime. Um, legally speaking, only written documents um, can be forged. So you can have a fake painting, um, which is perfectly legal, but if it has a forged statement of authenticity, which is why a lot of artists used to work with partners who did these, then that's, that's fraud. Yeah, yeah. That's the legal part. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so art fake, art forgery, kind of they're kind of the same thing. They can be um, used interchangeably. Um, but the, there's another weird. I was looking up, um, just watching documentaries and researching, and I found out um, there's psychological studies that have revealed that when when the human brain is knows that they're looking at a forgery, um, at a neurological level, it affects the way we look at it. Um, so if you're looking at, it, at something that you know is authentic, mm-hmm. um, and then you look at something that you know isn't, that you've been actually told is a fake, um, your brain reacts, like your brain does react to it. It's just the weirdest thing. <laughs> well, there's a, um, there's a discussion of this in... Uh... Oh, I, I can't, I gotta, I have to, I can't remember the book, which book, I'm, I'm sorry, which book it was, but um, there was a, a case of some Roman columns or something like that, or a statue that w- uh, experts were brought in to authenticate that a museum wanted to acquire. And the experts would walk into the room, and their first reaction was, "Ooh, no!" And but then they had to spend, you know, weeks proving their initial reaction, and that that that's because of, you know, the unconscious would pick up on, you know, mountains of pr- evidence from experience, mm-hmm. and the only way it could convey to the conscious mind was, "No, <laughs> there's something yeah, wrong I- here." That's actually one of the, when we get to how um, fakes are detected, it's actually very much science versus the trained eye. 
Um, and I, I think I sent you a, there's a, a particular family in, I uh, think they're in Paris, who are responsible for Manet, Manet paintings. And even if something is scientifically proven, there was an, um, an inc- there was a, a version of, uh, what's the TV show called? Baker Fortune. And someone had a Manet. And um, they, scientifically, they proved that this was a Manet. Like, absolutely, no questions. But this one particular um, organization just said no. Like, just, they took a look at it and just said <laughs> And it, it's crazy the way the art world works, but that's. But we'll get into that when we get into um how to, how you detect a fake. Okay. Um. So there's a lot of there's a lot of different versions of. So depending on who you talk to, you're going to get a different story about how they do it. Um. But what everybody agrees on is that you have to be a damn fine artist in your own right in order to be able to even attempt any one of these. Um. Mm-hmm. It's, so. Um, according to, there's a, a forger named David Stein, and he says, um, the first thing you have to know is know intimately the artist that you are imitating, not only to know him, but also to like him and to love his art. You go into the soul and mind of the artist. It's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing. You become someone else. When I painted a Matisse, I became Matisse. When I painted a Chagall, I was Chagall. When I painted a Picasso, I was Picasso. So there's a lot of, um, not only just the talent, but the actual psychological getting into the head of this uh, whoever it is that you're forging. Uh, That's they're... interesting because art as a whole, um, no matter what kind it is, I think that's the uh, best way to improve yourself is to borrow from your favorites, you know, whether it's writing or painting. There uh, was a famous author who would hand copy the works of famous authors to learn mm-hmm. how to write. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's actually one of the um, the writing tips that you get in some classes. If you like Jane Austen, then try and write something in the style of Jane Austen. Mm-hmm. Just, let's just don't try to sell it as a Jane Austen. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, there's an interesting um, story from um, our, our friend, Mr. Stein. Um, I'm going to read it just because it's, 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 it's how, he, how he managed to do one of his, his uh, forgeries. So he said, I remember one day when I opened a gallery out of my apartment on Park Avenue, I had an appointment there at 1 o'clock to deliver three Chagall watercolors that were not yet painted. I got up at 6 in the morning. The first thing I did was make some tea. I used Lipton tea. It's the best to use when you want to age drawing paper. It gives it a yellowish appearance when you uh, dip cotton in the tea and spread it over the paper. Then, while the paper was drying, I made the sketches. I decided on circus scenes. I was working mostly from illustrations from books. One by one, I painted them. I finished by 11 o'clock. When one was finished, I would put it in front of a sun lamp, which makes the material, uh, dries the material and cracks it slightly. It's like cooking. So then he rushed down to the framing place three blocks away, told them it was an urgent. They framed the three watercolors while he waited. Everything was ready by noon. He then ran six blocks back to a place on Lexicon Avenue to make photographs of the watercolors, rushed back to his apartment and made certificates of uh, authentication. Um, He knows Chagall's writing, so he wrote, I, Mark Chagall, certify that this watercolor is original. He signed Chagall's name on the back of the photograph. Within a few minutes, um, he was finished. Within a few minutes of the dealer arriving, he was satisfied and gave me a check for $10,500. Wow. So that's that's Jeez. that's process. That's one. That's just like I, I read that. I thought that's crazy. It's just um, <laughs> that's, yeah, it's working so under pressure. Yeah, seriously, a lot of running around when you're an art uh, an art forger. Um, but then you get you get all kinds of other people. There's someone said um, just as no one can play the violin in imitation of a master unless you first learn to play it rather well. So the whole thing comes back to you do have to have talent. You do have to have some skill. Um, you do definitely have to have training. Um, I think most everybody we were going to talk about tonight actually did go to art school um, of, of some. Mm-hmm. Sort. These people aren't just amateurs who just pick up a brush and think, oh, you know what, I'm going to paint a Vermeer today. Um, they they actually. <laughs> I, would, I would never start there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not like I admire them, but they actually do have, they do put a lot of work into what they do. Um, but as we'll see, the payout is, if we, if you don't get caught, the payout, the payout is enormous. Like, just 
huge. So, um, which yeah, brings up uh, a question that I had: Is we last week we talked about theft being like a billion dollar a year business? Is forgery on that same scale? Is it more? Is it less? I think at some point it might have been more. And then we talked about this, and I was thinking about it. But now that, um, like you know, like maybe forty or fifty years ago, um, or even a hundred years ago. But now that we've got so much science um, behind proving that things are um, frauds, I don't think it's worth it as much anymore. Mm-hmm. Plus, the the drugs and the the crime lords and stuff that's grown over the last you know couple of decades as well, um, which you know same thing the money follows. It doesn't take if, any uh, talent to steal. People wanted to see. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about this too. If people want to see a uh, bit about a real art forger, a documentary about them, go check out Orson Welles' F for Fake. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, well done. It's his last movie, too, that he ever created. Um, I got that coming uh, up here. If we, we're not going to be uh, talking about the forger in that one though I don't think right Kelly which forger is that is the movie about uh, it, trying to remember his name he's the Hungarian artist I don't think we are no and that is going to bug me now I have to look it up yeah I'm trying to <laughs> do the same there it is finally holy cow what a lag <laughs> I can start talking about my favorite if, if you're looking up. The, yeah, the, okay. sure. Um, okay, so my favorite art forger of all time uh, was a guy called Han Van. Um, I, I have trouble with his last name. Me, me Garen, me Garen. It's a, um, a Dutch, uh, Dutch name. So Han Van Me Garen. Um, he was, again, he was, he went to art school um, like uh, everybody else. Um, he was actually really really talented um but he kind of liked doing sort of old-fashioned type stuff like dutch golden age stuff um that was his main you know that he liked that the most art critics um decided his work was tired and derivative at the time that he was doing this stuff um the the cubists were doing their work and the surrealists and that was all sort of like the rage so they didn't really like van um mcgarren's work but he still was really, really good. Um, so he decided that um, because the art critics had sort of basically trashed his work and told him he wasn't very good, he was going to show them by doing some fakes in the style of some very, you know, very famous artists and see if he could get away with it. And basically he did. Um, he stuck to 17th century artists, the people that he, he really liked. Um, and one of them was Johann Vermeer, which who we just mentioned. Um, for those who don't know, and I don't want to talk down to anybody, but Vermeer painted the girl with the pearl earring. So that's his, one of his most famous paintings. Um, yeah, that's, a, he, that's a way most people would uh, know Vermeer these days. Because yeah. there was a movie. There was a book. There was a movie. There, I'm sure there, there's, if you see the memes, there's like a, like a million memes of her. They're hilarious. Mm-hmm. El Meyer de Hori. Oh, de Hori. Yeah, we can that's men- who's the movie. We can mention Dehori because it's funny because he's one of the only um, art. Okay, so he's a, a he's an art forger, but he's also got his work being forged. So, <laughs> it's, 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 oh, it's, turnabout. <laughs> yeah, so he um, he ha- he had a partner. Um, I, I guess a, a yeah, he worked with a partner. Um, and he, I think he, I don't think he, I don't think he's alive anymore. But the partner is, and the partner says every once in a while he'll see one of the faked ones. Um, it, yeah, it's crazy. So he got so good that people were actually faking him. <laughs> yeah, look at, you want to if you want to talk a little bit about him, definitely. Yeah. So so, um, so can I? Um, is there a distinction between somebody who replicates a known painting versus creates one in the artist's style from scratch? 
Do you know what I mean? Well, that well, that is what art forgery is. You're 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 painting something in the artist's style and then selling it as by the artist. Because you can't you can't paint the Mona Lisa and say, oh, here's another you know here's another copy of the Mona Lisa because there's already one. Is that what you mean? Right, right. But so there's no <laughs> there's no real market for like lost paintings being forged or anything well, like that. What you mean? Those, um, yeah, that that's a really tricky area, and you would you would get yourself on the suspicious list really quickly if all of a sudden you started coming up with lost paintings. Okay. Um, having said that, it might be something to look into for next week. Hold actually. on, I got to change my eBay listing. <laughs> 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 no, it's mostly um, it's mostly uh, like for example with um, Van uh, McGarren, he painted something called Christ with the Adulteress, and um, what he did during World War II is he actually traded um, uh, Hermann Goering 137 paintings um, for this one false Vermeer called Christ with the Adulteress. Um, I think I it's think coming I sent up. you. Did I send you a copy? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so he's got these 137 paintings and he trades it and Goring loves it. It's one of his most prized possessions. Like it's hanging on his wall in pride of place. And, um, he just, it was one of his absolute favorite paintings. Um, and of course he didn't realize it was a fake. He thought it was a Vermeer because the Nazis kind of like older, more (laughs) people. He, he just, he was in love with this thing. Um, and when the, uh, when it all started coming down and we'll go through this next week and the Nazis started storing all the art and salt mines and copper mines and stuff. Right. He, he stored that one away. He wanted that one back after it was all over. Um, I'm always laughing when a Nazi gets metaphorically or for that matter, literally kicked in the balls. So. I think that's probably why I like this guy the most. I, I guess I, there, there must be part of it. Like the rest, there must be some part of my brain that's going, yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stick it to the system. So basically, what happened was um, it all came out. Um, Van, Van McGuerin actually got charged. Um, they actually believed that the 137 painting, no, they actually believed that his, his painting, uh, the fake Vermeer, was real. Um, and they accused him of working with the Nazis, collaboration with the Nazis. Oh. Because they were giving he was oh. he was giving them Dutch art, and he shouldn't have been doing that. That was really so. So the penalty with that was like there was a death penalty for yes. um, collaboration with the Nazis. So he had a choice. He had to either you know he could just say no, or he could confess to being a um, an art court. <laughs> so, wow! So what, wow. Confess to the less serious charge of forgery. But they didn't believe him, so they made him paint another picture in the style of Vermeer while they all watched him, uh, like the police commissioner and all that kind of stuff watched him. And then after he had done this second piece of art, they went, oh, okay, then we believe you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. In fact, he actually said that he, he was sort of considered a hero because he actually managed to rescue these 137 paintings from the Nazis. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so not so not only did he kind of stick it to Goering, he actually did rescue uh, over a hundred paintings. Well, excellent. So it's, it's, he's a hero. He, yeah, well, he's he's an interesting character. Um, he um, it's estimated that he he duped buyers out of about thirty million dollars. That's in 1957 money. So I don't know what that. Holy kind of, cow! Yeah, <laughs> that's back when a million dollars was a lot of money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the government of the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. Did he ever do jail time? Um, I think he did. I'm just looking through my notes. He did. He got less than a year. I think he maybe got like six months or something. Ah, that's um, six months for 30 mil. That's pretty good trade. But the other thing is, um, this is what he did. And this is basically how he got caught. It was actually another episode of that um, Faker Fortune I mentioned. It's well worth a, a watch. It's, it's a fascinating show. Um, but they actually discovered one of his fakes on the show. So he bought authentic 17th century canvases. He mixed his own paints for raw materials, such as lapis lazuli, white lead, and indigo and cinnabar, using old formulas to ensure they would pass as mm-hmm. authentic. Mm-hmm. In, 
that. He made his own badger hair paintbrushes, similar to the ones that Vermeer used. Um, he came up with the scheme of using <laughs> Bakelite. Um, it's a type of formaldehyde to cause the paint to harden after application, making them appear as if they were 300 years old. After completing a painting, he would bake the painting at about 212 Fahrenheit, and then that would be to harden the paint. And then he would roll over it with a cylinder to increase the cracks. And then he would wash it in black India ink to fill in the cracks to make it look like it didn't, you know, age 300 years. So it took him about six years to work out this technique. But once he once he hit on it, man, yeah, he just he yeah made quite a bit of money on that. Um, but he did it, the uh, the Faker Fortune episode where they had a painting. I think they thought it was a Vermeer. Um, they also figured out it was him because of the Bakelite, because they were aware that he used this stuff. Oh. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But, yeah, he's uh, he's got to be my favorite. <laughs> I was uh, just thinking where you said that forging itself is not illegal, but it's the fraud that is. It's a lot like cannibalism. Cannibalism technically isn't illegal. But killing somebody to do it. Oh right, yeah. Right, is the problem. That's very weird. <laughs> yeah. Does it matter? Uh, you know, legally speaking, does it matter if you fake the signature on a painting or leave it no. unsigned? No. No, it's still not. It's still. Uh, it's still perfectly legal. It's only illegal if you um, get a document for it saying it's real. Hmm. Now, does anything, does that have to do with copyright at all? That is a good question, and I don't know. I don't think it has anything to do with copyright. Huh. Um, because otherwise it would be the forging the painting, not the forging the document, I would have thought. Hmm. Um, yeah. There's so many vagaries. And, and copyrights, copyright pr copyright's law. pretty new law, you know. Yeah, yeah but, I was thinking in, as well. As far as history goes. Yeah, and look at how many people mm -hmm. and I don't think anybody gets sued for that. So I think that's, I guess depending on, I guess, I guess it's like documents. Maybe it's public domain if it's a certain, um, if it's a, a certain age. As far as faking it goes, I'm not sure. But I do know that, certain museums and galleries do own copyrights on for example if you want to use a picture of the mona lisa on your cover of your book that you're writing um you you do have to either get permission or pay for you know pay to use it hmm. so some images depending on who owns them and depending on the museum and etc cetera, etc cetera, um are actually still subject to copyright yeah i know because i tried to use a an image from a swiss museum and it got real complicated <laughs> oh very interesting. That was fun. Um, are we we good so far? I know we ran over a little bit last week, so I don't want to do that to happen. But um, any, uh, should I go through? How yeah, who's detect? next? Let's do mm -hmm. how fakes. Who? How how do we detect a fake? Oh, okay. Because that's, it's gone You call the too. FBI. Dun, dun, yeah. dun. This right? Last week. Mm -hmm. But all those, um... I gotta put that awful logo up. That's why I said that. Oh, <laughs> I don't need to see that. I don't need to see that. How about the picture of the Mona Lisa with all those X-rays? Oh, okay. That's kind of a cool one. Um, so there are so many ways that. Oh, not just that's just awful. Isn't that yeah. awful? Isn't that terrible? I'm, I'm gonna design a new one on Photoshop and send it to them. Because <laughs> that is just. I don't know. I get that they want to put all, you know, little art pictures and famous art and stuff in the background, but seriously, there's too much going on here. Oh, there we go. There's our Mona Lisa. Talk about her last week. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll discuss what we're seeing on the screen in, in a second, but um, basically there's so many ways to detect fakes, um, and now that science has come in leaps and bounds, especially over the last decade or so, it's getting more and more difficult for fakes to be um, to actually be made like modern fakes. Um, what they are finding is a lot of the older things that they thought were legitimate and had been actually, you know, uh, verified as legitimate by experts and museums. They're finding out through all the new technology that quite a lot of those are fakes. Um, in fact, it's estimated that about 20% of art 
um, hanging in galleries these days is actually a fake. Wow. Uh, that's a huge <laughs> number. I think that's a bit on the high side, but it's like up to 20%. That's I think that might be just the uh, shock you with information in this article, but there are, it just says there are, there are a lot of them. Um, so basically these days, what happens is actually we've been connected in with a story. There's a, a Da Vinci painting called uh, the Salvatore Mundi and it um, was sold to, 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 I think it was the Abu Dhabi Louvre. Um, and then they bought it from Christie's um, in 2017 for 40, $450.3 million. And it was hold, meant- hold on. Yeah. Say that number again. <laughs> $450.3 million in 2017. Four, Jeez. five, zero. Point three. Don't forget the point, point three. Three million. Yeah. This this story is great. I love this story. I was, I've been keeping track of it, and so far, it, there, nothing's happened. But anyway, um, they, they did some restoration on it, and it was supposed to be unveiled on the 18th of September, 2018. But for some reason, a few days before it was supposed to be unveiled, the museum said, no, we're going to just postpone it. And they didn't give any reasons whatsoever. And there's been no further announcements. So I don't know what's happened. There, no one knows why they canceled this um, this large unveiling. Um, now, there's a bit of a, a, a kerfuffle in the art world about whether this is a forgery or not. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on with it. And now that the Abu Dhabi museum have it, they don't want anybody else to look at it. They won't let anybody else like do the x-rays or do the paint analysis or anything like that. Nothing suspicious there. Yeah. So it's very difficult to, to know what's going on, but if they were to take a look at it, if someone, a professional, like the Courtauld Institute, for example, um, in England is a specialist in actually analyzing paintings. So they look at the paint application technique. Um, was is, was the paint put on with a brush? Was it put on with a palette knife versus a brush? Was it layered on? How many layers? Um, you know, he went crazy with his layers, like more layers than anybody else on the planet would put on a painting, and Da Vinci did it. So that's one of the things that we know. It's one of his pieces of art. Um, were they paint strokes thick or thin? Paint strokes in the way uh, a painting is put on paint is, is almost like a, a fingerprint for the artist. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. one of the um, yeah. They do look at the autograph and the signature, so that is important. It doesn't make it illegal if you sign, you know, if it's a fake painting and you sign Chagall's name on it. But they do look at it because, again, the autograph and the way it's painted and the brush strokes, um, you can prove whether it's real or not. Attribution is an absolutely huge thing right now. If you cannot prove the history of the painting virtually back to um, the original painter than their studio then if you've got any gap at all in that even three and four and five hundred year old paintings then you've got a potential issue um, because at any point where you don't have information um, a fake could have been put in right so that's very important um, mm. so there's also on the back of the painting there's stamps seems like from- there would be a market for filling in those gaps <laughs> I'm sure that there probably is yeah um Again, but yeah, that's all part of the forging. Yeah, if yeah. you want, well, people will come up with a fake painting and just forge the entire attribution. So it's crazy. Um, you've also got uh, logos and things on the back of the painting. There's uh, um, stamps from canvas suppliers, stamps from framers. Oh, yeah. A lot of people use the same framers. Like Monet used the same framers for most of his frames, and they all have exactly the same stamp on the back. So, um, and you can. Mm. Some- these suppliers change the logo so you can tell whether it's like pre-1920 when they change the logo or post, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but we were talking earlier about science versus the trained eye. There's still a lot that a trained eye can do. People have studied, um, say someone studied Da Vinci for 30 or 40 years. They are going to know Da Vinci backwards and forwards. At least you would have thought otherwise it would be a huge waste of 40 years. (laughs) (laughs) Still like, might be. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, think um, I, I might be getting this number wrong, but I think there are actually only 20 um, Da Vinci paintings in existence. So whenever anything new comes up, like this Salvatore Mundi, it's always like, oh, okay, we got to be instantly suspicious of this, and let's do some tests, and oh, you won't let us do the test? Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Um, so basically, yeah, the brush strokes are like the handwriting, um, but the, the trained eye is going to see... The signature use of color, um, 
the 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 complementary colors, the stylistic sort of things that are intangible and you can't really measure with a microscope. Um, they actually also take um, paintings to handwriting analysis experts to check the uh, signatures. Like they oh, go, okay. and then this is where it gets fun. So this is the Mona Lisa in front of us. They X-ray the heck out of these things, and they run them through so many um, different types of light filters. So I'm just going to, so basically you've got infrared, you've got ultraviolet, you've got the x-rays. So I think in the one we've got in front of us, um, the one at the, the bottom middle is, um, that's one of the x-rays. And the one that's red, I think, I think the blue one is ultraviolet and the red one is infrared. Um, but whatever it is, you can tell in each of them something different. So if you look at the one that's very, very blue, you can see little blue dots and then something looks like a little blue thing stabbing her in the head. Those are all um, uh, corrections people have made. So repairs yeah. people have made. Oh, past. repairs. Okay. Yeah, repairs. They're not, yeah. Um, and there, there's just, you can see um, the black and white one up in the top right corner. Um, while she looks a little bit chubby most of the time you can actually see that her arm is quite thin and she's actually got a veil flowing behind her um, and that's not usually visible in the original painting so there's a lot more you can actually see here um, one of the most fascinating things you can also see is something called a pentimenti which is basically um, the artist when an artist when painting they they don't usually just get the final product down on the first try they might mm -hmm. like his fingers He's, he's drawn them in different ways until he finally gets the right way they should be. And you can see this under, um, like, when you x-ray them. So the fact that something has pentamenti, forgers wouldn't do this. When you're copying something in the style, you don't generally put in a deliberate mistakes. Um, right. And then when real painters are doing this stuff, especially the older stuff, um, you find a lot more of these pentamentis because they're, they haven't solidified the idea um, until like the very last couple of layers. What about the reusing canvases? That is, yeah, that's done a lot as well. And so that's where you get into issues with, um, was it done in a particular artist's studio? So it may not have been done by him, but it might have been done by one of his apprentices. Mm -hmm. um, and they did, they were known to reuse canvases all the time. Um, in fact, I think a few years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I think they found like an original da vinci but it had been painted over by one of his students and they only found it because mm -hmm. they sprayed it and did all the x-raying and stuff and they saw you know perpendicular to the, the the painting you could see there was another image under there but yeah it's often 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 done less <laughs> than 20 according to the uh oh. encyclopedia britannica okay i wasn't far off then. that's still a thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep on the web Oh, okay. Online now. Um, let's see. The last thing is um, chemical analysis of paint. They will actually take a teeny tiny bit of the paint off of the surface of the painting and run it through all, all sorts of analysis to figure out whether um, it's a modern paint, whether it's an old paint. Um, and then quite often they know from real paintings which different types of white the artist would use so they can compare the white to the fake you know, and see whether it's the same white, and it's just, it's all very, very technical. <laughs> what about, um, carbon dating? Is that a thing in paint, in paintings? No. It's not, they're not old enough, are they? Carbon dating is for biological, um, things, not, Well, they um, date, they carbon date rocks. Minerals. Well, that would couldn't they, they uh, carbon date the what's it called vellum, if that's what it's painted on? Um, I just um, may, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's just too new for carbon dating. It's dating. Too new, yeah. I've never heard of carbon dating used for paintings. But then, why would you need to with all this now that you can actually yeah. we do spectral analysis of microscopic bits of the red that they used in? You know, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, but yeah, there's with all of this going on now. Having said that, not everybody can afford to do this, and that's when we get into the the cost of um, forgeries. 
it will a lot of smaller museums there's no way they can afford this this is expensive stuff like in the more in-depth analysis you want to get into when you you know get out the x-ray machines and stuff like that um that costs an awful lot of money people have to be paid the technology has to be paid for the time etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. um it's like anything so there are quite a few um of the smaller museums that if they get a ford they i'm sorry a a forgery, fraud and forgery, sorry. Um, if they get it, what they think is a forgery or someone accuses them of having a forgery, a lot of the time they'll just have to put it away and either not show it or, um, you know, hang it up and maybe say, oh, we, we think this is a forgery, we're not sure. But most of the time what they'll do is they'll store them away because hmm. they just can't afford to prove one way or the other and there's no point in having it hanging, hanging up if there's um, questions surrounding it. So how big of a factor in you know, the admission of forgeries is just plain embarrassment. <laughs> right? Oh, crap, we just spent all this money on a forgery. Like in, you know, $450 million, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't happen. Well, you're right, it doesn't happen very often because no one wants to admit they did something wrong. No one wants to admit, like, look like an idiot, really. And right. I know that's... Um, but they're just, yeah, if you can afford $450 million for a painting, surely you can afford a little bit more to get it tested before you buy it, you know. Um, but having said that, Christie's themselves um, said this painting was authentic and um, pointed to some of the stuff that we just went through, um, including the, uh, the Pentimenti. There are, there's evidence in this Salvatore Mundi painting um, that the hand was moved a number of times, which is something Leonardo did. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. um, there is an interesting, actually, I'm going to jump forward. I'm going to, one of my other favorite guys. Um, so most of these people do it for money. I think we, we agree on that. They don't really do it right. out of the conscience of their hearts because they make a heck of a lot of money. Um, I'm just going through, so there's a guy called, um, Eric Hebborn and he ended up, let's see, he ended up making more than $30 million from his forgeries. Uh, there's another guy called John Maya, 200 forgeries he reckons he did. Uh, he earned about uh, 25 million euros. I'm going to have to do the math on that one. Um, but that's, yeah, oh, that's, I think it's about 40, 40 or 50 million dollars. Um, so, like, these people do make a, a lot of money from them. But there's this one guy called Mark Landis. He was born in Virginia. Um, his. Basically, he was, his father was, they moved around a lot. Um, his father was in the U.S. Navy, and he grew up in, like, the Philippines and Hong Kong and London and France and Brussels and all over the place. So finally they, um, finally they returned to the United States, um, and Landis went to, uh, let's see, he, oh, yeah, he, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia after his father died. Not that that really makes a difference, but it, I don't know, it might. Um so keep it in mind for what we're gonna what we're gonna say. Um, so Landis again went to um, art school, the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and he actually then got a job working on the maintenance of damaged paintings, which um, basically got him into contact with a lot of um, um, art dealers and art galleries and things like that. Um, so basically, he wanted to. Um, his father had passed away and he wanted to have like this, this fantastic painting in, in memory of his, of his father. So he, um, he donated, so he, he did this painting by a famous artist, um, called Maynard Dixon and he gave it to a California museum as an original. He didn't say he did it, but he gave it to the museum. He didn't, it was a donation. Okay. And so he kept doing this for 20 years. He kept painting, famous but you know emulating famous paintings forging famous paintings for 20 years and then he gave them to more than 50 museums did not charge them a penny did not take anything they were all gifts and because they were gifts none of the museums thought to check whether they were fixed or not because why would someone all right why would you do that um hmm. the other funny thing about him is he dressed up in like different he had different scenarios when he was actually giving these things um to the art so one of the aliases he had was uh, Father Arthur Scott, a Jesuit priest. So he actually put on a full smock with a priest outfit <laughs> when he was doing the painting. Um, that would be suspicious. I thought that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But the church doesn't give it away. <laughs> well, he would do that. He also used the aliases like Stephen Gardner. Um, uh, let's see. He was Father Arthur Scott, but he was also Father James Brantley. So he was two priests. Um, he just used a whole bunch of other names and stuff. And um, he just, I love the idea of him dressing up as a priest. And, and he used to make up the wildest stories, like, you know, like someone in the family died and they left this painting and he didn't want to get rid of it, but he needed the money for surgery for his mom. And, you know, he would just make up the most outlandish stories. And again, no one thought anything of it. Here's a poor priest giving us, you know, a heartbreaking story and he's donating this painting in memory of this person who's died. We're not going to test it to see if it's fake. Um, so eventually, <laughs> eventually he, um, he donated, he, he donated um, another a, a painting, and he said it's the, in memory of the loss of my mother. The uh, the director asked the registrar to check out the painting, and when they actually put it under ultraviolet lights, it kind of glowed very strangely. Um, it also showed sort of a dot matrix painting, um, hinting that it was a photocopy of the original. <laughs> which then projected onto a board wow. and then painted over. Um, so they, so that's how he got caught, just because one, um, one museum director got a little bit suspicious. Now I don't know. I haven't been able to figure out why. What was so? Well, maybe the fact that he was dressed as Father Arthur Scott and donated a painting. Maybe you know, maybe the whole thing was just suspicious, like you said. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically, uh... he, he never got any time. He didn't. He didn't actually break any laws, at all. He didn't, he didn't take anything, so <laughs> he yeah. Any, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't take any tax deductions for the work donated. He didn't sell it to them. He gave it to them. Um, he actually also addressed his donations to specialists at the museums, who he knew would have the expertise to to prove him wrong, and none of them did. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's just totally daring him to stop him. Yeah, pretty that's amazing. Cool. Having um, having said that, the damage, there's now a bunch of museums that have all these fake paintings, and even though they were um, given, and there's still the damage to reputation, because you're going to feel pretty foolish, um, and when you get a damage to reputation, then that has a knock-on effect for a museum. Um, like when I used to work at the Victoria and Albert Museum, there was a, a little issue with some um, constable paintings, and I think it took the museum quite a long time to get over that whole thing. <laughs> Right, yeah, and and, and what? A, yeah, what about the reputation to the people who were to the people, not just the museum, but the people oh, yeah. at the museum? I mean, that's got to be tough to have on your resume. Yeah, and the other the other kind of thing is, um, so for example, I worked for one of the people that was involved in this. And every every year, every few years, you got to get a whole new crop of employees like me coming in, and then you learn this little secret. So it never really goes away. Mm. But he was not he was not fired for it. There's there's the weird thing about people not really being fired for this um, because it's all done in good faith. It's not like they they use their best knowledge at the time, and if it comes out later that it's um, that it's phony, then uh, you know. It, it, they're not really held responsible, but yeah, from a reputation thing, that that's got to hurt <laughs> really big time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But but with such a high percentage, you'd think it would, you know, a lot of people are getting burned by this stuff. Well, they were. They used to be. So, for example, yeah. um, so let's go. Let's go to Van Gogh. Okay. So when Van Gogh died, he had his brother and his sister-in-law uh, left to to hold on to all his paintings. And his brother died, um, and then it was just left to the sister-in-law. She was really, really shrewd, like really clever woman. What she did was she built up the reputation by releasing one or two paintings at a time, and then people would see them, and she'd put them in galleries, like, you know, well-known galleries, um, and she'd lend them to exhibitions so that more and more people got to see them. So she'd kind of generate buzz, and then she'd say, okay, here's another two for sale, or here's another three for sale a couple of months later or a year later. So by the time she was older and all the paintings were out there, um, they were making quite a lot of money. I mean, it was after he died, which is unfortunate, but she did a huge amount um, in really promoting him and getting his paintings 
you know, recognized and worth a lot of money. But the problem is, while she was doing this, fakes were being entered as well. Fakes were being sold. Oh. So now, you know, this was, when was this, 18, well over 100 years later, what we're finding is not only do we have the original ones, but we also have a bunch of fakes that no one knew about. So now that everybody's kind of playing catch up with, is this fake or not? Because at the time, you know, thought it was. So, you know, they bought it maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago, or it was donated by someone in good right, faith. Right. And now they're stuck with, you know, they're stuck with a forgery they didn't know they had. So it's very, it, very... That would make an excellent game show. Yeah. Is this fake, fake? or forged? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, that, that British show, if you can see it, I think it's on... It might be on Netflix or Prime. I can never remember. Um, but it's called Faker Fortune. And basically what happens is they get um, they get a tip about a painting or someone will write to them about a painting or something like this. And they'll get the person in. They'll look at the painting or they'll go visit it because sometimes it's churches. Sometimes it's, you know, parliament buildings, whatever. Um, and mm. the one guy is uh, an art. Um, like he owns an, his own art sort of gallery. He's a, he's a dealer. Um, and the other woman is she's been a journalist for eons um they both they both actually work on the antiques roadshow if that makes anybody feel any better um so basically they take a look at this painting and they try and decide whether it's a fake or is it worth you know a fortune and they're the ones that will actually so bbc is the one i think putting the cost for let's send it to these people let's send it to these people let's get this sort you know this done this kind of a scan let's mm -hmm. You know, send it to the Courthold Institute and that kind of thing. Um, and then at the end of the day, they get some sort of pronouncement on whether it's so within one show. So it's all nicely packaged up into an hour. Um, you get some sort of, um, you know, is it yes or no? But it's through that show that I've learned so much about the forgery stuff because they go into it in great detail. Wow. And it's also like a little mystery and, you know, get your glass of wine, put your feet up. Oh, is it going to be real this week? Ooh, it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to check it out. It's actually, yeah, it is actually a really good show. Um, let me see. I have got, I've got two more, but I only want to do, I think I only have time to probably do one more. Um... Who are we going to do? Who are we going to do? Um, let me see who made the most money then. That'll be good. Or who? Oh, no, wait a minute. This is... Okay. Let's do Eric Hebborn because he had an interesting end. <laughs> he, um, he was born in London in 1934. And according to his biography, his mother beat him constantly as a child. He did not have a good... Uh, a good childhood. At eight, he uh, he set fire to his school. Um, he was sent to Longmore Reformatory. So he's just he's a bit of wow. a he's a bit of a lad. Um, and anyway, he um, teachers at uh, the reformatory um, encouraged his painting talent. So he obviously had some sort of natural painting talent. Um, and he got connected to an art club, and he first exhibited at age fifteen. Um, so he kept doing art again, like everybody else he's, he's done, he's, he's done an art, you know, art degrees and he's actually got awards. Um, he got the British, um, Prix de Rome in engraving. He got a two year scholarship to the British school at Rome. Um, so he had, he had talent, definitely. Um, he m became friends with a lot of people. Um, unfortunately he became friends with, um, Soviet spy, Sir Anthony Blunt in 1960. Oh, <laughs> who told him that um, a couple of his paintings look like um, uh, Poisson, who is a, a, another painter. So he thought, oh, looks like a, you know, a real famous painter. Maybe I can do something like this. So he, um, he moved back to London, and he was hired by, again, another one that was hired by an art restorer. So here he is. He's restoring art. It brings him even closer to the world he's going he's gonna to copy. And mm -hmm. it also brings him into um, contact with all kinds of dealers and things like that. So... Um, wouldn't he, uh, sorry to interrupt, but wouldn't restoration kind of train you a little bit in a particular style, because you need to make it, you know, the f repairs fit in. Yep, you're right, absolutely. So he, it's just like it's just if you're going to be a, a forger, this is the perfect path for you. Like seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Just, but then at that point, they don't know you're going to be a forger, so they can't really, you know. Right. To ask you on a on a, a, a you know an interview question or something, um, 
Will so, you try to forge Da Vinci? No. <laughs> you're planning on using with the education we're going to give you. Um, so basically, he went from restoring paintings to just what he called restoring paintings on blank canvas, um, so that they could be sold for money. Um, so he basically started forging. Um, he and his lover um, Graham David Smith. Apparently were um, antiquers. They used to go, uh, you know, hit every antique shop going. So they made all kinds of connections there. Plus they were able to get um, a lot of supplies and stuff. Plus they were able to see some, you know, a lot of paintings and stuff. Um, it's where he um, it, he fell in love with prints that um, one particular shop had. And some of these um, prints um, he had some really, really old paper. So he started studying paper and how to use paper and stuff like that. Um, so his first his first attempt at sort of really good forgeries were actually drawings on paper because he was so comfortable with the paper at that time. Um, but eventually he moved on to um, more um, old masters and more um, painting and more canvases and stuff like that. And let's see, his paintings were sold for tens of thousands of pounds through art auction houses, including Christie's and Sotheby's. So he's that good that he tricked them. Um, wow. wow. That's, that's impressive. So he, um, uh, there was a, a curator in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and he was looking at um, one of the paintings they got from him, uh, oh, actually, sorry, a drawing, and he noticed that there was already a drawing in the collection that looked like it was drawn on exactly the same paper. So he went and compared the two, and, he, and it was like, yeah, these two drawings are the exact same kind of paper. It's That's kind of weird. So he started investigating more because he thought this is kind of weird it's really crazy and then they found so another... you wouldn't expect that to be the exact same kind of paper um you would but you wouldn't um like if you had a large a, a giant sheet and you folded it into four pieces um each of those pieces is going to look like it came from a single sheet whereas if you have another sheet of paper that you do into four so now you've got eight pieces one from one pile and one from the other, there's going to be differences in them. Okay. Whereas there's going to be more similarities if you have a large piece. And what they used to do in paper shops, like for um, for people who wanted to paint or draw, is they used to have like just large rolls of paper. So you just get a huge roll of paper and tear it off. And you'd be able to tell because that type of paper would have similarities from a different roll. Does that make mm. sense? Okay. Just, yeah. Just the way the paper's made. Um, so basically this guy thought this is weird. So he starts investigating it and that's basically... Um, how he got caught, but he was, <laughs> he actually, um, he, he did a little bit of time. He estimates he did about 500 more drawings. He made more than $30 million on this. So very profitable. Um, he also wrote a book on how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's got the art for your handbook. Wow. Um, That's impressive. <laughs> That's yeah. I'm going to have to get that. Not yeah. that I want to get into foraging art, but it would look good in my collection. Yeah, I would. I'm kind of thinking I might need to get that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. He had all kinds of claims. He um, he wrote a biography in 1991 called "Drawn to Trouble," so you can see by the picture he looks a little bit like a a lad. <laughs> Um, but basically, right before, uh, right after the publication of the Art Forger's Handbook, um, he was found lying in a street in Rome, having suffered from massive head trauma, possibly delivered by a blunt instrument. Oh wow! I, he died three uh, three days later. So it seems to me like he might have pissed off the wrong person. Maybe so, or it could maybe have just been a random mugging. Catch or, yeah. Anyone. It just seems I don't know, or it could have been another art forger who didn't like the fact that he published this book. <laughs> <laughs> Giving away the They're secrets. <laughs> wow. So that's pretty much, other than random thoughts about how long this has been going on for. So Michelangelo did it. That's you know, it goes back as far as that. But what came to me um, is that probably the oldest one, and I don't want to be sacrilegious, is um, relics. So during the oh uh, uh, yeah. Crusades, all of these knights came back with pieces of the true cross. There are literally millions of tr pieces of the true cross. As well, there are saints' bones, there's saints' hairs, there's, you know, and there's still churches all over the all over the country that have pieces of these. And you know, there can't possibly have been 
you know, that many of St. Edmund's teeth. Like, how many teeth did the guy have? So some of them have to be <laughs> fake. So, he was actually an alligator, so. Well, yeah. okay. That's just exactly <laughs> okay. um, But it, it just made me think that the oldest relics have got to be whoever was selling them to these people in the in the Middle East. Shroud of Turin. Um, oh, that's, yeah, that's a, that, I think that is a big practical joke and I love it. Yeah. That one has been debunked, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, know what I mean, I think it's a, I think someone was playing a huge practical joke and it took us like 500 years to figure it out. And that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A... In uh, Roman Catholicism, you can't have a church without a saint's relic to go under the altar. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. So there's a there's a big market for uh, magic bones. Well, the market is drastically shrinking as people uh, flee the church. True. Perhaps justifiably with how they've handled all these uh, sex abuse allegations. And how many new cathedrals go up anyway? Yeah, well, almost none. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they're they're probably they probably don't need any at all, but but yeah, I just I thought about it the other day and I was thinking, oh wow, okay, that's kind of cool. I should mention that. <laughs> I wonder if the uh, Orthodox Church does something similar. They might. I don't know. They might. I'm getting a sense no, but I don't know why I think that. So I have to look it up. I don't know. It'd be interesting, but yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, there's potentially when you're going and touching a saint's bone, you're you're basically the oldest Rick Roll on the planet, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm, pretty much. Spe speaking of which, I Rick Rolled a friend the other day, and she doesn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if she'll uh, know what I did, but anyway, moving on. Evie, that's um that's pretty much everybody I've got. Like I said, um. Van Meergeren, there's all kinds of YouTube documentaries and stuff about him, so I definitely recommend having another look, just because he gave it to, you know, he gave it to the Nazis. Um, and Mark Landis also, just because he dressed as a Jesuit priest and gave away his paintings, and I think that's, that's I don't know. That's, that's pretty funny. funny. Yeah. Kept him out yeah, of jail, though, the, didn't uh, it? The guy from Orson Welles' movie. And uh, Orson Welles. And Fake or Fortune. I de definitely recommend that. It's so good. But yeah, I'm going to have seen that Orson Welles movie, so I'm definitely going to be uh, putting that on my list. So Kelly I and I... it's the only one he did that was more or less a documentary. Right. Mm hmm Before the show, Kelly and I were discussing... Uh, we, we had talked about... Talk, just briefly mentioning the Hitler Diaries... Yeah. Uh, but after looking into it, it was decided that's that needs a whole show. Yeah, I think so. That Definitely. is a big story and a very intricate story that starts mm -hmm. with a plane crash at the end of World War II and leads mm -hmm. up to great fraud. <laughs> Just wondering whether you could do it in one week and not two. It's it's just they're so convoluted. <clears throat> yeah. So much stuff going on. <laughs> <clears throat> mm. Well, boys and girls, that's pretty much all I got. I mean, I could keep going on. There's a bunch of other people. I know. I think I sent a couple of other pictures, but yeah. I'm conscious of the time. There's just there are so many. There are basically um, the master, the pure masters. There's probably about maybe five of them. Like, and we're talking like the ones that we've already gone through, especially. Um, well, not Michelangelo, but the Van uh, Meegeren and stuff. There's, there's the true masters of it, and they all seem to have things in common. They all went to art school. They all like to paint their own style, but they're kind of derided by other people, and they all really have a sense of vengeance. They really want to stick it to the people that actually told them that their their work wasn't any good. It seems to be the three top <laughs> things that they all have in common. Hmm. That and being incredibly talented. I'm not, and again, it sounds like I'm I'm idolizing them, but they re oh god, they really are talented. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Uh, it it really is, does take a massive amount of skill and dedication mm -hmm. to do these 
things. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, being a painter is hugely expensive. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Especially, yep, it is. Especially if you're um, like our friend who, uh, the, the Van Meegeringen, um, he actually like bought lapis lazuli so that he could make his own paint. I mean, come on, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if you're not a forger, <laughs> if you're just yeah, using yeah. modern materials, it's still massively expensive. And yeah, if you're, you got, you know, you got to feed that habit somehow. Yeah, I, I tend to get new paintbrushes like every 10 years or so because I'm so cheap and I actually use them until they literally start wearing off and <laughs> leaving hairs in my work. Mm -hmm. I just... But yeah, um, I, last when uh, last Christmas I got um, on my wish list. I got what I wanted. Some really beautiful brushes. So, but I yeah, think so. the uh, key there is proper cleaning to preserve them. Yeah, the other key is don't buy cheap stuff to start off with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very important. I do, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't do enough uh, to warrant spending money on brushes. I'm more of a pencil guy. Uh, okay. Oh, I was going to say coloring books don't count. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Finger oh boy, paintings. I got myself some very, very nice um, Japanese ink brushes, and I, I took a Japanese ink course, and they're Ooh. just, they're so nice to hold, and they're so nice to paint with, and the, the lines come out beautifully, and anyway, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. If you don't if you don't shut me up, I'll be here forever. So <laughs> shut up, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next week we have Kelly once again for yeah. episode three of Art Crimes, and we're going to talk about the real baddies. Yeah. Nazis. This, this one's going to. Yep. Be, we're going to have to tread a fine line here, I think. Yeah, it's it's not a funny subject here. You know, there's there's really nothing. For, th there are some positives, but it's not a, you know, it's not a light subject. No, it's not. So I have to be careful with that one. But anyway, yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting one, because I don't think people know just how much they did and why they did it. Like I. I I think people have a, a vague understanding that they, yeah, they did actually steal some art, but just the enormity of what they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Industrial Probably scale by theft. Arguments, yeah. man. I might have to go watch that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so much better than the book. Don't, I'm, I'm not saying, like, I'm not, not recommending the book, but the book is, a little bit dry if you like troop movements and all that kind of stuff then yeah it's your thing but it's it's not as light and sort of character driven as the movie <laughs> hmm. okay there you go everybody okay. go study up for next week <laughs> there, will, <laughs> there will be a, there will be a quiz <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, all right good night good night, good night. Thanks, guys <laughs>